Well, welcome to the Debt Matters Podcast, where we help Canadians find solutions to their debt with licensed insolvency trustees from across Canada. I'm Wayne Kay, and in today's show, I'm going to be talking about student debts, and that's a, uh, a big issue. That's something that a lot of people are definitely struggling with, and to find out all about it, we've got Mark Marshall joining me on the phone from... Uh, We've got Mark Marshall joining me from Allen Marshall and Associates, licensed insolvency trustee in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island. Mark, welcome back to the show. Wayne, I'll also point out we just recently opened offices in Alberta as well. Oh, terrific. Okay, expanding, right? right. That's a quite the jump going all the way to Alberta. I mean, I'm originally from Alberta. I was born in Alberta, so I just kind of seemed like the logical spot for us to, to kind of venture to next. Oh, okay. There are different laws when it comes to the different provinces, right? There is. Yes. Yeah. They're not that different. I mean, there's just, um, yeah, I mean, there's just kind of fine, fine little details that you have to be aware of, uh, you know, when chatting with people from different provinces. That, and again, we, we've we gotten up to speed and speaking to some our lawyers in Alberta and, and kind of aware of what those little increases would be. So, um, yeah. Terrific. But I, one thing that is common between, well, all over the uh, Maritimes and through the prairies is student debt. Are we, I wonder if we're seeing higher student debt than ever before. I would think so. I I think um, I would say yes. And I wouldn't say that it's because somebody is uh, attempting the, or, or students or prospective students are, are necessarily borrowing more than they did in the past. I think just the cost of school, the cost of life, uh, the cost of being a student has gone up. So um, you know, your, your standard course 25 years ago, your standard university course might have cost you $2,500. Now it's probably $7,500 to $10,000 mm-hmm. uh, for a semester. And so, so, of course, it forces students to, uh, to reach out for whatever means they can, they can get their hands on it. So, uh, you know, student loans, whether it's uh, not from the national program or from the provincial program, yeah, students are borrowing more money to, to get uh the same education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I've just uh, got through this with my two kids. Both have graduated and it's extremely expensive getting them through secondary school, post-secondary school. Uh, And it's the living expenses, really. That was what I was surprised with. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's, uh, I mean, we know that the cost of living is going up. It it just, it it is, I mean, with the pandemic and inflation, the cost of living is going up, but Mm -hmm. uh, rents, I mean, in, in some of the, larger centers in Canada that, that the universities are located in, uh, you know, the Halifaxes of the world, Toronto, you know, Calgary, Vancouver, um, finding basic housing is not very affordable. No. Right. So it's, so when you, you know, let's say that you land in uh, UBC or you land at Dalhousie in Halifax, well, great. You've got accepted to the program and now you got to find a way to pay to live in that center. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden we have a pandemic that comes along. So here's graduates get out of school and then they don't get into maybe the career that they were hoping to get into. And maybe some money trouble comes up because you do have to pay back these loans. Yeah, you do. I mean, it's, the, the expectation, obviously, with a student loan is your your goal is to obtain employment and then be able to pay it back. However, you know, with student loans, um, you know, depending on a couple of things, you can, if you're experiencing hardship, a bankruptcy or consumer proposal, you can include student loans in both of those proceedings. But as long as you've been at a school for more than seven years, um, anything short of seven years, you, uh, you know, is the is the the debtor or the individual carrying that debt? You have to take the steps. Um, you know, to make sure that you are, are kind of keeping contact with student loans, keeping them aware of what your financial situation looks like uh, and applying for their programs, interest relief, whatever programs are available to them. If you're finding you're unable to make their minimum payments. OK, because I, I did hear, uh, you know, how people talk and they say, well, student student loans are never involved with bankruptcy, but it's after seven years. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, it's it's. And it's it's one of those things. I mean, you want to as an individual, if you're considering that as an option, is that, and I always suggest this to any client that that I chat with, is that you're going to want to confirm your what your what's called your end of study date with the National Student Loan Center. You want to confirm what they have on record as the end of study date because that is what they're going to use. Because if you've been at a school for six years and eleven months and ten days, it's not past that seven year mark, and you got a problem. Oh. All right. So you, you, you want to confirm that end of study day because 
sometimes students will say, oh, I, I you know, I graduated on on the 15th of June uh, from my program and that's my end of study date. And then the 16th of June, they're looking, they're saying, look, this that's the date that I'm going to pull the trigger on a, on a proposal or a bankruptcy. When the fact of the matter is what it what the student loans will have on record generally is the the, the final day of that month, right? So they would have the 30th of, of June, for example, as their end of study date. So an individual always wants to confirm, um, you know, their end of study date with national student loans uh, so that they can kind of determine their best course of action and, and arm themselves with information. So if you were to go and uh, put forward a bankruptcy or a consumer proposal, and they were at that six, six years, 11 months, 25 days, so they say, no, can you not just wait the five days until the full seven years and then reapply or how does that work? You, you, you wouldn't be able to reapply. I mean, what happens is the issue you'd run into, there's, there's a couple things is that if you, if you find yourself into a bankruptcy, if you've tripped yourself or triggered yourself into a bankruptcy and you're short of that time frame, then the debt automatically survives under a section of the act, nice. section 178 that says, hey, this, this debt survives because it's not older than seven years. So then the individual, if they were, if they were doing an assessment with a trustee, the, the trustee generally would ask them for the information, confirm your end of study date. And if it were me, I would be saying, you may consider this option five days from now, mm-hmm. right? So that we have that seven year mark. Now, if the mistake is made, right? The mistake is made. Um, what options does the debtor have? Well, at that point in time, technically you're at the mercy of the court. You can make an application to the court to ask them to include that debt in the bankruptcy proposal proceedings. But again, it's not, mm-hmm. it's, it's never a clear decision. Anytime you find yourself uh, in, in a court, it, it can work in your favor. It can work against you. Right. That, that's great information. Let's talk about this. Uh, somebody has uh, decided because they're, they're just not making enough money. They can't make ends meet. Um, and maybe they went through a bankruptcy or a proposal and they said, enough is enough. I, I want to go back to school and get myself a career. They've got their eyes on some kind of a job that's going to put them into a, a great tax bracket. Uh, if they are currently in a bankruptcy or a proposal, will they still qualify for a student loan or do they have to wait? Generally, they'd have to wait. I mean, it, it's it's not a clear cut answer because you'll find that when you make that those inquiries with student loans, um, a lot of times what they'll tell you is that they'll look at every every situation on a case by case basis. But generally speaking, um, what they're looking for is for you to be discharged from your bankruptcy or from your proposal. They're looking for that that discharge to, to be in the range of about three years before they will qualify you. But again, with that being said, they do look at things on a case by case basis and, and what all read to you um, is just a a line for line item here that I'd received from uh, the National Student Loan Center. And they they indicated that uh, anyone that's over 21 years old who applies for a student loan is subject to a credit check. And so one of the questions on that credit check is, have you declared or filed for bankruptcy in the last, uh, have you declared a proposal or filed for bankruptcy in the last three years? If the answer is yes, then the application will be denied. However, they do indicate that um, if you've been out for three years, that they will consider the application. However, they also look at it from a perspective is that even if you're not in a bankruptcy or proposal, if you have serious credit abuse issues, uh, if you have not paid loans or you've let debts slide into arrears over 90 days, uh, they will also deny your application for a student loan. However, they will look they will look at everything on a case by case basis. So the answer is they likely will deny the first application that an individual that's coming out of a bankruptcy or a proposal or an, an individual that has poor credit history, they'll deny that application, but they will review it upon appeal. Okay. But I liked all the how over, however's. There's a lot of however's there. <laughs> uh, I know it's it's it, it's a difficult thing because it's you can't give a clear cut answer, and it's it's um, you know I mean historically they will deny, but uh, you know the squeaky wheel will get the grease, and and I look at it from a perspective as just as you led into the question is that if an individual is looking to improve themselves and they're not looking to necessarily abuse a system, but they have been accepted into, uh, you know, a good program, an elite program, a program that's going to provide them with some financial needs. Um, 
I think student loans, regardless of your credit past, will will take the program and your personal situation into consideration when looking at the application. Now, again, broad stroke, they probably may put an X on it the first time, but you got to stay with it and, and stay on them. I like that. Okay. That's good to know. So don't just walk away when they say no for the first time. You can keep at them. And uh, yeah, I like that. Squeaky yeah. wheel does get the grease. Absolutely. Um, and I think this is a really important point as well, that you've gone through the bankruptcy or proposal. You've, you've been terrible with your credit. After you go through that, there is credit counseling that you guys offer that they have to go through. This is part of the deal. And I guess this is where you have to really, they have to understand that it's a one shot. You know, they've already, they've had these issues. Now it's time to clean it up because it really can affect a lot of things that they may not even be thinking about in the future. And that's it. I mean, and it's part of the process in a bankruptcy or proposal an individual is required to do uh counseling sessions with the trustee and, and the role of the trustee is in these sessions generally is to sit and define historical mistakes and try to help the individual alleviate those, understand credit, understand how to manage credit, look to reestablish themselves, and then ultimately, you know, help the individual establish some goals and and try to help them achieve those financial goals. Uh, and and that, you know, the goal can be anything from, you know, making sure that you get a, you know, a savings account to, you know, maybe going to Walt Disney World in 15 years. It, it, it I mean, a goal can be anything. You can mm-hmm. establish what you want. And then the, the key here is obviously is to then structure your budget to get there. So you finally get that loan. How do you make sure that it kind of stays in good standing with, uh, you know, National Student Loan Center or Canada Revenue Agency? Are there some tips on that? Yeah. I mean, what happens is you just got to, I mean, the thing is, is they're not going to collect on it while you're in school. So the key is, is that you, you, you borrow the money, use the money for the intended purpose upon your completion from, from school. And the expectation or hopefully you're landing some work uh, is that you update the, the student loan center, let them know you're working. Now, the minute that they're aware that you're working and you have some income, they're going to want to structure some kind of a payment plan. The key is to keep them in the loop about what you're earning right? And provide them with information to substantiate it. You want to make sure that pay stubs are submitted. You want to make sure that tax returns are submitted because the plan here is, is to kind of set up a plan or set up a payment that is affordable. And again, they may lean on you hard and say, well, here, here's the, here's the amount you borrowed and here's what our payment plan will be. Well, if you can't meet that payment plan, then you got to start to kind of ask questions about what programs are available, uh, you know, within the student loan system to allow me to, to alleviate the payment or apply for interest relief, um, you know, or, or to, to make it something that I can afford to do. What you want to be aware of is you just don't want to go quiet on them. That happens a lot. And a a lot of times student loans are government guaranteed debt. So, so what happens is you go quiet, uh, student loans can't contact you. There's no payment arrangement being made. And then what they're doing is they're taking that loan and they're flipping it over to um, the government. They're flipping it over to Canada Revenue to collect on. Now, oh. what, once it's in the hands of Canada Revenue, I mean, they, they've they got a little bit more power and they've got the ability to, to garnish. They have the ability to withhold your tax refunds and your GST. And so, you, in my opinion, you want to avoid it getting to that point. You want to kind of maintain a good working relationship with the national student loans and send them the information they want. And my advice to everybody is detail everything that you send them, right? If you respond to one of their requests, make a copy of what you sent them, make a copy of who you spoke to, make a, a copy of the date that it was sent, because I will hear these horror stories that they'll say, I, I, you know, I sent the information to student loans and they said they didn't get it and I'm tired of it. I'm not sending them any more information. Well, you're going to have some problems. And let's say that you have financial problems in the future and you find yourself uh, in a bankruptcy or proposal. I mean, yeah, you can include that debt, but there's nothing stopping uh, you know, a creditor from opposing your discharge or saying, you know what, we don't want this individual to get discharged from bankruptcy. We want the student loan to survive. And one of the factors that the court will look at in, in student loan situations and is, you know, was the money used for education purposes? Did you finish the education? Did you drive some economic benefit from the education? Um, did you apply for all interest relief programs? And generally, did you act in good faith? Like, did you communicate? Did mm-hmm. you make them aware of your situation? Because, you know, the courts, when they're reviewing applications under, you know, Section 178, to decide as to include a student loans if there's issues. 
is they will look at those factors. And if you go blank or you say, ah, for two years, I didn't bother sending them the information, uh, it may not work for you. So the, the key here is just communicate and give them what they want as frustrating as it might be. Mm-hmm. I think that right there, that's like the information that every person needs to know if they get a student loan, right? Exactly what you just finished saying is so critical that there are uh, many different options, uh, programs you can you can definitely be taking part in, but you have to apply for them, but you definitely have to be looking out for yourself. And hey, just like, uh, you know, you and I, I can text you and you didn't get my text, right? Something happens. Yeah. So you never know. I send you a couple, I've sent you like five emails. I don't hear back from you. What happened? And it turns out I had something wrong in it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change what you, was required from either of us in that interaction. We still have to share that information, right? So yeah, you do. anything and, can happen. And you, yeah, and you want to be able to back yourself up by yeah. saying, look, on this date, I sent this, on this date, I sent that. And and if you're not willing to cooperate with me, well, then there's got to be other channels. And But again, you want to make sure that you're documenting what you're doing just so that you can, you can support your position at yeah. any point in time. Yeah. Are there some other maybe factors we need to consider before agreeing to obtain this student loan? Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest factor and most people don't do it. And I see people, you know, all the time that they run into the situation is that they get themselves out of high school, mom and dad, or even themselves are saying, you got to do something. You got to go to school. You got to do something. And they find themselves applying or taking a program, um, you know, something that they don't want to do necessarily, or something that they're not even necessarily aware of what they're going to be getting into and, and what the income would be from it. And they're applying for student loans and they're getting the student loans. And and I'll see that all the time where someone will say, look, I was young and stupid. I took $30,000 for student loans and I paid my tuition and I partied for the first year that I was away from home. And now I owe this money and, I, and you know, I'm and i working a minimum wage job. And I, I think that any student or any parent that's helping a student, you know, you want to encourage them. Education is key. You know, education is freedom, but you kind of know what you're getting into. I mean, know what you're going to drive for income at the end of it know that there's going to be some employment at the end of it. You know, if you're taking out a hundred thousand dollar student loan to obtain, you know, like a general arts degree where, you you know, you're not necessarily going to find that the income that you need, maybe an arts degree will get you to the next level of education you need. Maybe you then know, Hey, I'm going to become a teacher. So that makes sense. You just have to know your stepping stones and kind of look at it and say, okay, what, what's the cost analysis here of borrowing this money? And yeah, it's going to be free money for now, but am I going to be able to pay this back in the expected time frame and, and based on the income that, you know, you're expecting to receive. And I think that sometimes that's lost. And I just think sometimes people are looking to say, Hey, I got to do something here. And, and you know, they're, they're, they're looking to get into school. They're not even sure what they want to take. And I, am a strong proponent to say, Hey, sometimes, you know, going out and finding a job after school and getting yourself into the real world and kind of getting a feel for what you want to do before you start to spend money on something that you're not sure that you want to pay for in the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll tell you, as I mentioned, both my kids went through school and both of them started their first year of school and changed the plan, even though they had a plan for probably three, four years pre going to school, it did change. And most of their friends did too. So I think that's yeah, great it advice. It absolutely happens because you don't know until you actually get there what this whole new world is going to be like. No, and you get lost in it. I mean, I did too. I mean, when I went to university in the 90s, like my first year was a was a waste of time and energy, but I had a lot of fun. And <laughs> you know, you, you you hear that from a lot of people, but it's uh it's, it's you know, you pay, you pay the price for that fun. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this has been a very helpful uh, student loans is something that so many people are getting involved with. So, Mark, thank you very much for all this great info. Thanks for having me. You got it. Mark Marshall from Allen Marshall and Associates. To learn more or to get a free consultation, you can go to wecanhelp.ca. And that's it for today's Debt Matters podcast. You can subscribe wherever you get your favorite podcasts from. And of course, if you do want some more information, you can always check out debtmatters.ca. Thanks very much for listening. 